It's my real pleasure to introduce um, another one of our new colleagues, Dr. Tiffany Fry, um, who is um, our new curator of um, um, historical and contemporary archaeology um, and assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology. Um, Dr. Fryer's session is toward a holistic analysis of violence in and through archaeology. I'll turn it over to Tiffany. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? No. Okay. Oh, what about then? That, that did it, didn't it? Let me move this up a bit. How is that? Is that carrying? Yes? Okay. So good afternoon. I'm from a place where we respond. So good afternoon. Hey. <laughs> Great. It's really good to see all of you here. Um, thank you, Rob. And Thanks to my fellow curators who I had the great pleasure of um, organizing this conference alongside. It's a great way to start to get to know you guys um, and to the staff of, of UMA for just doing a really, really incredible job this, this weekend. I know we've just started, but I'm sure all of you have noticed the extreme fruits of their labors already. So um, thank you all. So it feels... Uh, rather momentous that my appointment as an assistant curator of historical contemporary archaeology should coincide with UMA's uh, centennial <laughs> uh, celebration. I think this curatorial role, for those of you who know UMA, is sort of a new curatorial framing for the museum whose um, research ranges, as they're referred to here, have typically been delimited along uh, more geographical uh, sort of areas than uh, temporal or intellectual lines, which I think that this sort of new role for me reflects. I'm really excited to figure out what such a curatorial emphasis might be able to do in this space. And I think that this session here uh, is, a, is a means of us uh, beginning that conversation. So one of those possibilities pulls a thread that uh, my intrepid uh, uh, panelists today that you're each going to hear from um, have been touching on in their own ways. Uh, and that is that uh, a curatorship in historical and contemporary archaeology, as among other things, is an invitation to consider and grapple with some of the more difficult histories at the intersection of archaeological, anthropological, and museological practice. Uh, histories that have often emerged from, uh, perpetuated, or been actively ignored by um, uh, these blatant violences. So one of my major areas of research focuses on political violence. And that was the inspiration for this session today. Violence, of course, has been of interest for a long time to archeologists um, and scholars and alumni of UMA itself have paved the way for, for many of the advancements in the analysis of warfare, violent conflict, social upheaval, uh, inequality, and the use of force uh, to maintain power in the past. But the speakers that I've invited today, I see them as sort of pushing those contributions to consider how violence has been defined and mobilized as an analytic in archaeology, uh, what the limitations of exploring violence through archaeology have been, and how the field might move toward a more holistic consideration of the phenomenon. So for today's first session, for instance, um, we saw demonstrated that Although our primary questions of the archaeological record may not always be about violence, violence is nearly always a ontological context within which people are operating, have operated, and, and of course continue to operate. So bearing this in mind, my own scholarship approaches political violence not just as a mere synonym for war, for instance, which I think is a, a common terminological slippage in the literature, but as a function of war or overt uh, violence, of structural or sy systemic forms of oppression and sociocultural practices and sort of the amalgamation of all of those things. So in other words, I see violence as a complex social and material right, process that plays out both at the scale of exceptional event and at the scale of mundane daily life. And, and the, we're gonna see the oscillation between those things um, in many ways throughout these presentations. And I think, in other presentations this weekend, even if that may not have been the original emphasis. So attending to violence in archeology span 
I think importantly, and as we've begun to hear this weekend, also means turning our gaze on how violence has worked its way through the discipline, uh, through structural and um, sometimes outright means, and what might be done to repair those damages um, uh, in, in, our, in our future and in our midst. So we heard some really, I think, important and uh, honest reflections on what that has looked like in last night's plenary. I think that some of the papers and, and, and conversation that we're gonna have in this session is gonna be an extension of that conversation. Um, and, and these concerns about violence underpinning archeology, span they used to be pretty marginal in our, in our field, right? And, and in some ways they continue to be so, um, but I do think that recent years have shown how important the work of reckoning and repair is to our futures as a discipline um, and also just in general, right? And so increasingly, I think we're seeing more attention being given to these uh, more meta areas of research as well. And I want, I want to just take a second to, um, to also applaud the graduate students of UMA for all of the work that they've done in that direction over the last couple of years, um, really charting new directions and setting new expectations for, for the museum um, that, that, you know, I'm feeling very inspired by as I set out, you know, in, in my new role here. Um, and that I also think they may not be aware have really ricocheted through many of UMA's networks, right? And the, the kinds of um, spaces that their curators and their faculty um, are involved in. You, the work that you guys are doing is being seen in those spaces now as well. And so you should be really proud of yourselves. I know, um, I, I know I am proud to be amongst you all learning um, together now. So this session uh, features four scholars whose work I respect immensely and who I think um, are laying ground for a, a new wave of archeological theory about violence and meta theory about the conditions of practice and knowledge production in our disciplines uh, writ, writ large. So I'm gonna introduce each speaker uh, before their papers. And then hopefully at the end, I think we've timed it just right. We're gonna have a lot of ample time for discussion um, amongst ourselves as, as panelists, but also uh, hopefully guided by the many questions I'm sure you all come up with for us. Um, so before introducing Professor Amanda Logan, who's gonna get us started, I also just want to quickly close these introductory remarks um, by saying that you know, I think despite the weightiness of this topic, the weightiness of a topic like violence, um, it's also a real pleasure to be here amongst all of you um, discussing it and really uh, giving it space that I think it hasn't always had. So um, I am excited for the conversation that is going to emerge and I find myself hopeful because of it for the next hundred years. Um, even if I, you know, still approach things uh, with, with a level of skepticism and, and, and caution at times. So with that, allow me to introduce Dr. Amanda Logan. So Dr. Logan is an alum of Michigan's doctoral program and an associate professor of anthropology at Northwestern University. Now, this is my first occasion to actually meet Dr. Logan, but I have followed her work for some time. Uh, I was serving on the board of the archaeology division of the American Anthropological Association when I encountered her quite transformative 2016 article, Why Can't People Feed Themselves? Archaeology of Food Security in Bandagana. And it made such an impression on the board and myself that we awarded it the Gordon R. Willie Prize for the most influential archaeology paper published in American Anthropologists within a three-year span. This paper has stayed with me. I teach it in every class that I've taught, which admittedly hasn't been that many, but it is enough <laughs> that all of those students have read it. Um, and, and since then, uh, her, her really momentous book, the, Scar the Scarcity Slot, Excavating Histories of African Food Security, has been published with the University of California Press. And she continues to chart research that explores the relationship between taken for granted conditions like food security and the long processes of colonialism as they have unfolded in Ghana and across Africa more broadly. So Dr. Logan, um, I welcome you this afternoon. I think we can just use the arrows to 
Everybody hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you, Tiffany, for that generous introduction um, and for inviting me into this session, as well as thanks to the organizing committee for the invitation back. It's been a long time, um, but it's nice to come back under these circumstances. Um, I'm also really excited to be in a session with so many archeologists I respect, um, though I'd be lying if I didn't say this was a tad bit daunting. Um, so today I'd like to talk about how archeologists might approach slow and structural violence um, by examining uh, my own journey into this topic. Um, I was really um, impressed with the way the speakers last night sort of humbled themselves uh, before all of us and admitted to past failures and mistakes. And I think this is a really important um, way to describe the research process, particularly for graduate students, but we all can use reminding, I suppose. So I want to emphasize this is a work in progress. I'm still learning. Um, and I look forward to continuing to do so through the work of many of you. In so doing, I continue some of the conversations that we heard last night around where Michigan's brand of comparative, generalizing archaeology works and where it needs to change. How might we challenge future generations, or perhaps if we're being honest with each other, um, how are future generations challenging us? So for the first part of this talk, um, I'd like to begin with a sideways glance that emerged during my graduate studies here. In 2009, I set off to do a second season of doctoral work in Banda, West Central Ghana. I'd previously done a lot of archeological work in the African continent, um, including Banda the previous year. Training at Michigan emphasized a comparative approach. What did all of these places tell me about human behavior? So armed with a questionnaire designed to understand food change, I embarked on six months of ethnoarchaeological work amongst villagers in Banda. I was convinced at the time in the way only overconfident graduate students can be convinced that I could build a general model uh, to help us understand food change more broadly. But what this ethnographic experience revealed was that my questions were all wrong. For the, ethnographic research is indeed a humbling experience. Here is rare photographic evidence that I may regret sharing of this from an earlier project in Senegal as local women laughed at my feeble attempts to pound grain into flour, a skill I have still not mastered. Community work requires a lot of listening and learning, inevitable miscommunications, and going back to the drawing board numerous times. Through my work in Ghana, I began to understand how food choice was constrained daily by the realities of poverty, to understand the resilience and skill of farmers and cooks and even putting food on the table. And of course, to understand the deep ties between food, identity, and gender. I soon began to conduct my interviews in a more open-ended, less extractive way, encouraging my interlocutors to ask me questions too. One question that came up again and again was, of what use is this project to us? I soon came to realize that that was the question I should have been asking all along. It flipped my entire research design on its head. I began to see my archeological questions from a different angle, much as a Dali painting reveals the distortion of take it for granted, such as time. That sideways glance, as Zizek has called it, revealed how the structures we have created as archeologists, as predominantly white scholars from the global north, have not always been questioned as they should. Why conduct digs and ask questions of interest primarily to archeologists of the global north that were largely irrelevant to surrounding populations? Could we instead use this incredible privilege to reframe our questions to more urgent concerns in the 21st century? Those 21st ch century challenges were all too clear to my interlocutors. Cooking with Ama Georgina, one of my very first contacts, made these abstract challenges very real. Here, surrounded by her grandchildren, she pre prepares tuozave, a hard porridge-like staple common in tropical West Africa. While I'd had my fill, and I mean fill, of Tuo Zafe during archeological field seasons, it was usually an off-white color of sorts. I had never seen it the greenish gray color that Ama prepared that day. But of course I hadn't. I was white and comparatively well-resourced. You see, Ama was making dinner at the height of the rainy season, a time known as the hungry season gap, when last year's harvest was finished and before the current year's was ready to eat. To stretch thin food supplies farther, Ama had dried the peels and ends of cassava before grinding it into a usable flour. Given the humid conditions, this drying often results in discoloration that is partially the result of mold. 
Still, despite these challenges, Amma persisted. She put food on the table. At first, this reality seemed to fit archaeological models of food change I knew all too well. People, preferred, uh, people move on to less preferred resources once their first choices are exhausted. This observation, drawn from optimal foraging theory, is alluring in its elegance. But it fails to explain why Amma's food supplies were stretched so thin in the first place. It fails to account for the obvious pattern I'd seen again and again working in ancient urban centers in Africa, South America, and elsewhere. Why is there such poverty today in many of the so-called ancient cradles of civilization that archaeologists love to study? And why did we not ask this question? Dr. Fryer prompted each of us to talk about how we might move towards a more holistic archaeology of violence. Today, I'd like to focus on one way we might deduce structural slow violence and how it unfolds over time. To do so, I'd like to start with a broad definition of violence drawn from the work of Norwegian sociologist Johan Galtung, a pioneer of peace studies and one of the first to forward the notion of structural violence in a classic 1969 article. To him, violence was when people were influenced to achieve less mentally or physically than they're capable of, what he called their potential. Put another way, violence to him involves, quote, avoidable impairments of human needs. This diffuse definition incorporates the more visible forms of direct physical violence, like warfare, that are often the focus of archaeologists, with the less visible indirect forms of structural violence, like racism, that are often documented by historical anthropologists and archaeologists. Structural and direct violence are, of, close, uh, of course, directly interwoven, as is clear in our own lives, where institutionalized racism in the United States continues to result in direct acts of violence against black people. Structural violence is analytically murky, though, for a few reasons. It often has no clear perpetrator, and the temporal scale in which it unfolds is a lot less obvious. Instead, structural violence is perpetrated daily by large numbers of people by being complicit in a social order rife with inequalities. Collective, normative participation obscures the visibility of these violent acts simply by making them routinized and ubiquitous. And here's where a sideways glance can help reveal forms of violence hidden in plain sight. To address the second issue of temporality, I draw on Rob Nixon's concept of slow violence. In his 2011 book, he develops, develops slow violence to look at how environmental pollution builds up in poor areas, exposing already disenfranchised populations to higher levels of toxicity. Slow violence acknowledges the often delayed and attritional impacts um, of structural violence and how then this temporal dispersion impacts the visibility of and response to social afflictions. In cases like environmental pollution, toxins build up over time and people are repeatedly exposed, resulting sometimes, oftentimes, in ill health. Although the effects on health can be just as deleterious as more direct violence, agency and intention are muddied as oftentimes it becomes hard to pinpoint one exposure. Toxic exposure is instead a long-term process that defies simple cause and effect arguments in a society that is enmeshed in a short-term or crisis mentality. Food insecurity, which is going to be the focus um, of the remainder of my time today, shares a lot of similar characteristics. When we hear about food insecurity, it's often in the context of crises like famine and drought. And two things are implied in these framings. First, that food insecurity is sudden and catastrophic. And second, that non-human actors like environment are to blame. The emphasis on crisis events relates in part to their high visibility compared to slower processes of violence that happen on an unremarkable timescale. In African context, while famine events are emphasized, it is actually the low level um, seasonal food shortage that is more common and experienced by much larger numbers of people. The attritional effects of such low violence can be spectacular, spectacular indeed. Populations who have long suffered from low level food shortage are much more vulnerable to severe food crises. Michael Watts calls the accretional nature of food insecurity silent violence because it leads to the perception of hunger as normal and permanent. Acknowledging chronic food insecurity as violence is important because it calls attention to the impacts of food shortage on well-being. Biologically, severe events like famine clearly have a physical impact on the body and may ultimately result in death. 
But even low-level food insecurity can result in undernutrition, which can have long, uh, lifelong impacts on physical health and mental development. What I'm getting at here is that the impacts of food insecurity on health may be just as severe as more obvious forms of direct physical violence, yet they're not often recognized as violence at all. In many instances of structural violence, the agency and intentions of perpetrators are masked. For example, food insecurity is often framed as an environmental problem, a mismatch between production and population in a very Malthusian way. But decades of food security scholarship has shown that it is more the result of persistent structural inequalities. Chronic and severe hunger is disproportionately visited upon the global poor, making food insecurity one of the most pervasive forms of structural violence in the modern world. Even the worst of famines are often the result of inequitable distribution of foodstuffs rather than an absolute shortage in food supply. People suffer because they cannot access sufficient food supplies, whether that's due to lack of money, land, social capital, or all of the above. Yet popular news media portrayals still emphasize non-human actors like climate change and especially drought, a slate of hand that acts to both depoliticize and dehistoricize food crises. And here I think archaeology's long-term gaze is essential for adding both politics and history back into the mix, but also for constructing alternative empirically grounded narratives. So what I'd like to do with the remainder of this talk is consider how we might approach slow and structural violence in the archaeological record. Here I return to the idea of a sideways glance, a challenge to view structures and everyday forms of violence we might accept as normal from a non-normative angle. Put another way, many forms of violence seem normal to those of us who are not directly affected. But experiencing such violences opens one's eyes to its presence. Michael Blakey described it last night as living in two worlds, referencing the experience of black academics. One of the best ways to do this is to diversify our field. Scholars from different backgrounds who are products of structural violences of the present have long viewed societies from a so-called sideways glance that is much different from normative white male voices that tend to dominate our field. So too is generation. Our graduate students, as Tiffany just described, have pushed many departments to reckon with our overly white and overly male demographics to good effect. But so too is class. Many first generation scholars are often not familiar with the frames of reference that inform their upper class academic peers and may be in a better position to offer a sideways glance. Now my vantage point is one of privilege as a white woman employed at a top tier private university. And this is part of the reason I want to point out my own oversights in the research process. Yet as a first generation scholar and trauma survivor, I often found myself in the position of contrarian. Throughout my education, I always wondered why there was so much archeology span focused on elites and their impact and much less on the poor and how they became disenfranchised. Working in West Africa, I couldn't ignore these gnawing concerns any longer. But how could we best put archaeology to work in cases like this? Galtung's definition of structural violence as an avoidable impairment of human needs provides a starting point. To him, quote, violence is here defined as the cause of the difference between potential and the actual, between what could have been and what is, end quote. What I want to call attention to is his analytical attention to potentials, which provides the seeds for an empirical approach we can document through archaeology. One way to coax out potentials is through cross-period comparison or a genealogical approach. Archaeologists have been doing this for decades. For example, we might look to production um, in a time and place before being taken over by a colonial power. We, before a major drought or other events that allow us to impact the, uh, evaluate the impact of such events. In some cases, these events lead to a loss in potential. People are no longer able to produce the surplus they once did or to engage in long distance trade as before. Instead of using tried and true archeological frames of reference to understand these shifts, glancing these changes from the side means we might see loss of potential and reveal structural violence in action. So let's dive into a tiny bit of data. I promise it's just a tiny bit. Um, to make this relatively abstract approach hopefully make sense. Um, here I'll draw on my work in Banda, Ghana, the subject of my recent book. Um, in the book, I build on the work um, of Michel Rolf Truyot, um, looking at how Africa has been othered as a scarce place and then using archeological evidence to kind of contradict these myths. 
Um, I'm not going to rehash the arguments or really even tell you what's in there. Um, but if you want to see more, the book is available free and open access through University of California Press. So in the book, book, I focus on the last 500 years all the way up to 2009. Now, this is a particularly interesting time frame to look at structural violence because it encompasses a lot of major scale global changes, many of which we've heard about already and, and will continue to do so. In Banda, these included a shift from the trans-Saharan trade to transatlantic networks, including the growth of the Atlantic slave trade, as well as takeover by the Asante and then British empires. Over this time span, there was also tremendous environmental change, including a prolonged drought that corresponded with a little ice age in more northern latitudes. While I don't have time to go into details, my focus has been on tracking food security levels during these major shifts using primarily plant remains. What I'd like to draw your attention to are two periods of drought indicated in red. You'll note a higher level of food security during a much more severe uh, prolonged drought last, during what we call the Kulo phase that lasted a couple hundred of years and relatively high food security during that severe drought and a major decline in beginning in the late 19th century when environmental conditions were ideal and continuing into today's much less severe drought conditions. What this comparison shows, I'm gonna argue, um, is that the region has the potential to maintain high food security levels even during severe drought, but that some of this potential was somehow lost in the late 19th to early 20th centuries. Elsewhere in the world, Mike Davis has noted similar loss of potential to cope with environmental change that he attributes to British colonial policy. I think archeology span has the power to show this loss of potential and therefore the emergence of structural violence in contexts where written records aren't forthcoming. But the next step is to reveal the processes by where the potential was lost. Now, as we all know, causality is in any context is notoriously slippery in part because we're often limited to observing correlations rather than definitive cause and effect relationships. In cases of structural violence, the waters are even more muddy because it's difficult to pinpoint a single perpetrator or a set of perpetrators. While archeologists may not only always be able to settle on the details, I think we do something valuable simply by anchoring structural violence in time and place. So let me illustrate by returning to the Banda case study for a minute. One of the most critical inflection points in our sequence, as indicated here, um, concerns the late 19th and early 20th century, when multiple material indicators suggest major drops in food and economic security. Turns out, Banda wasn't the only place to suffer in this way at this time. Uh, multiple historical records, including colonial height records, as well as early ethnographic and medical observations, suggest malnutrition was a major problem from the turn of the century onwards in what is now known as Ghana. Colonial officials went to great pains to burying this troubling trend. Dr. F.M. Purcell, a doctor hired by the British government, British colonial government, excuse me, um, linked nutritional de deficiencies with poor health outcomes after studying populations in coastal Ghana. And this was published in a grisly 1939 volume of which you see uh, an image here. Now I've selected this picture carefully um, as the least graphic among them, but one which bear still bears witness to um, the tragic nutritional deficiencies of the era. Now Purcell went on to do a similar study in Northern Ghana, an area with much higher rates of poverty than the coast, also where Banda is located um, in the interior regions. And there Purcell found even more disturbing levels of undernourishment. But that study was prevented from ever being, ever being published and survives today only as a de decaying tattered set of documents in the Ghana National Archives. Comments in the margin from a higher up officer indicate why. No one may starve in the British Empire. Instead, these deficiencies were recast not as a problem of empire, but as a natural feature of African environments and their backward agricultural practices, a recasting which has remained remarkably tenacious even today. Yet archeological reconstructions of food security suggest a very different pattern. One which not only challenged the idea that chronic food shortages are a natural part of the agricultural cycle, but one which points a determined finger at colonial negligence. In this way, I propose that archeology span in the past be used as an act of corrective to the force forgetting that was and is part and parcel of the colonial project. In this session, many of my colleagues will illustrate the power of this archeological intervention better than I. 
To realize this session's challenge to forward a holistic archaeology of violence, I submit that we have to keep our eyes open to the possibility of violence in all times and places and temporalities. Structural violence in many ways is a strategy of empire. Its diffuse, ubiquitous nature means that perpetrators escape notice and find safe harbor. Archaeology might be an effective tool to pull back the curtains, so to speak, on these slates of hand. In this paper, I presented one model for how we might go about doing so. We can begin with a sideways glance at figures like this one. Why is global poverty and food insecurity concentrated in some areas and not in others, or less so rather than others? We can investigate this question um, using archaeology to track potentials, or I prefer the word capabilities, as well as culpabilities over time. This approach attends to the unfolding of structural violence over time, as briefly described for Banda, where high potential for food security was eroded away through centuries of marginalization. I do prefer the use of capabilities rather than potentials, as the latter um, might imply a lack of ability on the part of modern day peoples to live up to what was possible in another time. Instead, ethnographic work has shown the tremendous capabilities of people to survive the most trying of environmental, economic, and political challenges. The conditions under which potentials were lost or capabilities are re were reconfigured, gestures towards finding culpability, not necessarily in local failures, but in global scale processes of disenfranchisement. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Logan. You guys can all hear me again, yes? Okay. No? Sort of. Better? Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for that um, piece. So I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce our next speaker and sort of hold all of my, my racing thoughts for Dr. <laughs> Logan, which is uh, crushing me, but they'll come out. Don't worry. Um, and, and, you know, I was trying to think of when I first met Dr. Matt Riley, and you'll have to correct me if I get this wrong, but I want to say it was at the Curacao conference for EAA, the sort of, uh, EASA split, um, which was focused on slavery and forced labor, um, you know, maybe five, six years ago. Um, and since then, our mutual interests in violence, race, and colonialism have continued to bring us together in these, in these kinds of spaces. And so it's been a real um, pleasure getting to work with, with Dr. Riley um, and, and sort of see the progression of where his work has, has taken him, especially um, the work on whiteness that he's, that he's done um, and that you're going to hear a little bit about today. So uh, an assistant professor of anthropology at the City College of New York, or CUNY, Dr. Riley's 2019 book, Archaeology Below the Cliff, Race, Class, and Red Legs in Barbadian Sugar Society, chronicles the work he carried out in Barbados, focused on how poor whites fit within the social matrix of uh, sugar production and slavery on the island. He's since um, begun working in Liber Liberia on, among other things, uh, the ways that colonial histories and histories of civil war are deeply intertwined in the country. And uh, you sort of get a sneak peek of, a, I guess, a third leg of his research today about the ways that, um, that violences uh, have underpinned uh, uh, archaeological practice, especially in the United States, um, but I think we might extrapolate globally uh, for some time. So. Thank you, Dr. Riley, uh, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's always dangerous when you get that question. Did we meet at a conference at one point? I'm sure we're all thinking that's probably true. Probably, right? What time was it? <laughs> I'm just going to jump right in. The handwritten artifact catalogs of Montroville Dickinson are like many written by archaeologists or curators. They describe many of the so-called Indian, Indian antiquities of the mound builders he would later introduce to East Coast audiences throughout the mid-19th century. <clears throat> 
They're descriptive, including material, function, and decoration, also known as provenance. In most cases, making clear that the objects were not excavated by his hand, but rather acquired through purchase or coercion. For the latter, there are some telling entries in his catalog. For instance, item 114, terracotta pipe, found near the Faraday Mound, Louisiana. It was used by one of the slaves for two years, believed to have been made by the Choctaws. Now, in what follows uh, in the early part of this talk, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of the context of this archaeological archive, and you'll see some sketches, maps, and other drawings by, uh, by Dickinson himself. Uh, but later, you'll be seeing some longer block quotes that are coming from the journal. And rather than read them aloud, I think it's important that we sit with them and read them in our own internal voices, um, largely because it's something that we need to do in a room full of archaeologists, especially in a room full of largely white archaeologists, myself included. Mm -hmm. So uh, you'll see a lot of those quotes coming up in the next few slides. But to begin with, Montroville Wilson Dickinson explored indigenous burial mounds in the Mississippi Valley between 1838 and 1848. He paused his medical residency to explore this region and kept detailed journals of his expedition. He traveled from plantation to plantation, rubbing elbows with wealthy planters, where it may have been over lavish dinners that owners kindly offered their extra hands to assist in his expedition. These hands, of course, were like those that once held the Choctaw pipe. They belonged to enslaved Africans and African Americans. When read in a particular way, Dickinson, Dickinson's manuscripts chronicle the method, methods and thoughts of some of the earliest archaeologists ever to work in the, United, in the United States. They were enslaved. It shouldn't come as a surprise that enslaved people came across indigenous artifacts while they labored in agricultural fields of the Mississippi Valley. But this fact is rarely documented and even more rarely discussed today. The violence we seek to address in this paper is therefore twofold. The violent and dehumanizing labor practices that allowed archeological science to grow and the subsequent forms of archival silences that persist in how we think about the field that made the past. This weekend is a moment of celebration, but also of reflection. After all, two years prior to Dickinson's excavations at Faraday Plantation, University of Michigan geology professor Douglas Houghton would donate a Chippewa canoe, thus starting the ethnographic collection of what would become the Museum of Anthropological Archaeology, or UMA. In such moments, it's incumbent upon practitioners and institutions to grapple with the realities of our shared pasts if we hope to achieve more equitable and emancipatory futures. Speakers this weekend, especially those on this panel, represent the vanguard in archaeologies of care, restorative justice, and anti-racism, as well as more senior scholars who brought to light the darkest chapters of our disciplinary past and sought to generate more inclusive, community-based, community-oriented ways of thinking about the past and the present. As Amanda said, not intimidating at all, sure, yeah. This paper and broader project attempts to wed the two, but it really germinated from pedagogical reflection. I began teaching at the City College of New York in 2017. City College, part of the City University of New York, or CUNY system, boasts one of the most diverse student bodies in the world. The overwhelming majority of our students, in addition to being first-generation college students, claim BIPOC identities. In larger introductory courses to archaeology, students and I have reckoned with the fact that they saw themselves and their, or their ancestors as the objects of archaeological research, but very rarely as the producers of archaeological knowledge. Where in the history of the field, or in the contemporary discipline for that matter, were BIPOC populations? We know of their presence, the archaeological hewers of wood and drawers of water. But what did they think about the past they were materially confronting? How did they shape the emerging science of what would become archaeology? More pointedly, drawing from the title of Alison Mickle's excellent recent book, it's worth exploring why those who shovel are silent or rather, why they're often rendered silent. With COVID halting fieldwork for ongoing projects I direct in Liberia and Barbados, I pivoted, when safe, to archival work, primarily at the University of Pennsylvania. Penn's archives, like those housed at institutions like Harvard, Yale, Chicago, and right here in Michigan, contain invaluable manuscripts related to early expeditions, including field notes, diaries, photographs, maps, correspondence, inventories, and rarely even laborer profiles. 
In scouring these materials, students and I prioritize discussions related to laborers and general perspectives on the communities with whom archaeologists worked. For this paper, which is co-authored with a former undergraduate and MA student, Stephanie Barnes, we draw from the archive of Montreauville Dickinson, as his early and extensive manuscripts provide hauntingly detailed accounts of the enslaved pioneers of archaeological practice, even if Dickinson himself didn't see them in that way. Dickinson is not considered one of the more significant founders of the field, though some biographical publications lament the lack of credit he receives for his pioneering methodological rigor and expansive investigations of indigenous sites across North America. He is, however, representative of a larger group of intrepid expeditionists, many of whom, including Dickinson, trained in fields other than archaeology or anthropology, who received funding from American universities and institutions to set out across the country and globe to study disappearing cultures and line the walls of newly christened museums. If, you, if you're unfamiliar with Dickinson, you may be familiar with the famous painting shown earlier, depicting one of his projects. Oh, the previous one, sorry about that. There we go, okay. This is the work of Irish painter John J. Egan, who was commissioned to paint the much larger panorama of the monumental grandeur of the Mississippi Valley in the early 1840s. Completed in 1850, the painting is a massive 348 feet long, consisting of 25 individual scenes depicting the splendor of the Mississippi Valley with a rather unique focus on archeological work. Dickinson himself commissioned the piece, offering him the opportunity to later charge 25 cents to East Coast audiences eager to witness the bucolic Mississippian countryside and capture a glimpse of exotic, stoic, and noble Native Americans. The money, accrued, the money accrued from this, uh, from this touring panorama funded many of Dickinson's future archaeological excavations, which would later be uh, uh, put appropriated Indian antiquities on display to showcase the exotic primitive other to white audiences around the country. In this small section, excuse me, featured in select introductory textbooks, two white men act as overseers of enslaved black laborers. One of them is likely Dickinson himself. As a teaching tool, this image usually, including in textbooks, references early scientific methods, namely stratigraphic excavations. What is yet to be discussed in that, what was yet to be discussed is that the excavations were taking place on the cotton plantation of William Faraday in Louisiana, and that it represents a broader pattern of what we refer to as the archeology span plantation. One of the manuscripts in the Penn collection that provided much of the narrative presented in this paper was a journal by Dickinson titled Catalog of the Stone and Terracotta Implements and Ornaments of the North American Mound Builders. Dickinson's journals were divided according to region or set of mounds. On the left side of the manuscript is journaling of his experience, while the right side maintained a catalog in list form of all the findings. His journal entries provide ethnographic accounts of mid 19th century plantation life in the deep south and how it played a role in the development of Americanist archeology. span And it's that latter portion that I'll focus on the remainder of this talk. Dickinson often stayed on plantations, many of which were on the lands of the mounds being excavated, otherwise they were nearby and served as temporary homesteads for Dickinson during his travels. He frequently wrote about the hospitality of the hosts who were the owners of these plantations and homes, describing the dinners and warm evenings outdoors on verandas. As referenced earlier, enslaved men were used to excavate the mounds, with Dickinson noting that the plantation owners, quote, volunteered their services and also that of their force. Dickinson observed the enslaved during his stays on plantations, frequently referring to them as Negroes and commenting on their, quote, peculiar phraseology and superstitions. During excavations, Dickinson describes the enslaved workforce as hands and gangs. He frequently mentions the enslaved making discoveries during excavations, which is never mentioned in publications related to the mounds. Dickinson seemed very curious about the enslaved, seeing them as fearful and peculiar. He mocks their speech, writing phonetic phrases in his journal. It is clear Dickinson worked very closely and frequently with the enslaved. Despite the reliance on these men, detailed accounts of the mounds and archaeology texts never make mention of the enslaved labor that was implemented for these discoveries. <laughs> 
Roughly half a dozen times, Dickinson notes that enslaved people are in possession of Indian antiquities. In some cases, he convinces them to turn over the artifacts at no cost. In others, he provides a small sum, or in instances when the individual tries to strike a hard bargain, has the planter or manager force the individual to hand over the goods. On one occasion, he came across a stone pipe in the possession of one of the Negroes on a plantation near Natchez, Mississippi. Despite his efforts, quote, no offer of money would induce him to part with it, but, but he allowed me to make a facsimile cut into soft sandstone. The pages of Dickinson's diaries leave no question as to the violence of slavery. In an early entry from July 1843, while visiting Quitman County, Mississippi, near Quitman's Mounds, Dickinson describes the scene of roll call in the early morning hours. The serene morning sun was interrupted by the ringing of a bell with the following scene that took place. When it came to excavation, Dickinson relied on the knowledge of the enslaved. He, as well as select overseers, sought their advice on where they had previously come across antiquities in the fields. For instance, on the same day Dickinson had earlier witnessed roll call, the overseer, quote, mustered sufficient force, meaning he forced the enslaved to join in what would be a day of stratigraphic excavations. And here is the scene that unfolded. And again, I'll let us sit with these quotes as we make our way through. Well, I'm sorry, the formatting has gotten a little messed up on this slide here. We can still get the, uh, the points. Days later, Dickinson set out to explore Lewis's mounds, named after the planter who owned the property. Here he notes the following. Well, you know what? I'm going to try to lower the, uh, the font size so you can see everything. There we go. There we go. In a final telling example, Dickinson descended upon Binghamon Plantation, just outside Natchez along the Mississippi River. I'll come back to the passage referencing the music and also I want to draw your attention to the final line, we set our force to work. These selections from Dickinson's diaries provide an overview of his field strategy. Dickinson hopped from plantation to plantation across the Natchez area of Mississippi and Louisiana. At this point in the 1840s, this was one of the wealthiest areas in the United States for white planters and others who benefited from King Cotton. Dickinson visited some of the most opulent planter homes ever constructed, complete with neoclassical columns and whimsical live oak. He was clearly taken by the general atmosphere of the cotton belt, regularly being impressed and pleased by the gentlemanly behavior of the white men and the work ethic, orderliness, and efficiency of the hundreds of enslaved who did his work for him. The last line quoted from Dickinson is a telling example of how the plantation mentality seeped into early archaeological science though we tend to remember and revere the method rather than the violence. Perhaps it's time we think less about the, quote, proper dimensions and a sketch of the outlines of the group, end quote, and more carefully consider the implications of, we set our force to work. In the midst of the plantation violence rather callously glossed over by Dickinson, he simultaneously reveals thoughts, practices, and coping mechanisms of the enslaved peoples he encounters. For the latter, he is repeatedly amused and bemused by the music of the enslaved. One particularly lengthy passage comes from his visit to Faraday Plantation, located on the Louisiana side of the Mississippi in that same Natchez cotton belt. And again, the quote's got a little cut off here, so I'm just gonna try to make them a little more legible. 
There we go. It's hard to miss the derisive and derogatory tone of the ethnographic description especially when compared to his glowing review of the music of, quote, a higher order from Mr. Faraday himself. The scene simultaneously speaks to the vicious white supremacy that characterized this early expedition and the post-field moments in which the earliest crews found a semblance of joy or even creative expression. The final element we'd like to address is the complex ways in which the enslaved archeologists thought about the material past. These thoughts are difficult to articulate clearly, primarily because of, because of the translator's racist attitudes and unwillingness to acknowledge the meaningful beliefs being expressed. If you recall, in the summer of 1842, Dickinson learned the location of an indigenous site from enslaved laborers at a plantation owned by Mr. 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 Lewis. When the enslaved were asked about the exact whereabouts of the site, this is the scene that then unfolded. This is the last one, I promise. I know it's a lot of reading, but I think it's important that we grapple with some of these passages. Rather than speculate on African influence cosmologies or the degree of Christ, uh, Christian assimilation, there's an opportunity here to think about relationships between African Americans and the indigenous. Terry Wyke's work in this region is particularly telling in this regard, noting how Chickasaw and Choctaw removal in the 19th century led to complex encounters and relationships between indigenous and African peoples. Explorations of how African descendant, indigenous, and African indigenous people experience various forms of settler colonial violence might also include how the enslaved conceptualize the indigenous past and present. Perhaps Dickinson's failure in comprehending the, quote, peculiar phraseology of the enslaved masks a particular kind of reverence for indigenous sites and material culture. Dickinson perceived fear, superstition, and avoidance in a number of instances. This may certainly have been the case for some individuals. But if we can draw your attention back to the start of this paper, we want to present another form of engagement with the indigenous past. Dickinson's catalog notes the terracotta pipe found by, produced by Ch uh, Choctaws found at the Faraday Mounds. It entered Dickinson's collection after being taken from an enslaved man who had used it for two years. In July of 1842, Dickinson would describe another instance in which the enslaved are engaging with the living past of the Choctaws. At the very least, these are documented instances of enslaved people very purposely engaging with indigenous material culture and sacred spaces. How might our field have developed differently if such engagements were taken seriously from the outset and insights from African and indigenous populations counted equally as archeological knowledge? Furthermore, could we envision different futures related to the reverence, respect, and afterlives of indigenous or black American burial grounds? In closing, we found one anecdote particularly to, uh, from the diaries particularly relatable to those of us who continue the craft of archeology. span While visiting a mound site near White Apple Village, Mississippi in 1844, Dickinson notes that he narrowly escaped a drenching rainstorm by seeking shelter among the ruins of Fort Rosalie, a former French outpost. We've all been there before while out in the field. However, Dickinson was not alone in finding shelter in this precarious location. And here I want to draw your attention to that line in bold. The more rain, the more rest. <laughs> 
The juxtaposition of how the rain was experienced by Dickinson and those laboring is a fitting metaphor for the archaeology plantation. In addition to making a name for himself, Dickinson pioneered methodologies and built knowledge surrounding the indigenous past on the backs of the enslaved. His manuscripts indicate that enslaved people were routinely stripped of the archaeological finds and forced to labor grueling shifts in the fields and in the trenches. At the same time, Dickinson unintentionally provides insight, albeit tinged with white supremacy, into how enslaved peoples on these plantations conceptualized the material past. This isn't the ethnographic care of Zora Neale Hurston, but the voices, words, actions, and thoughts of the enslaved are present. Across oceans and decades, archaeologists similarly wrote about the community surrounding excavation projects and the laborers working under various circumstances of unfreedom. There's more in common between these early archaeologists than the commitment to scientific rigor that they shared. An espoused white supremacy jumps off the pages in a variety of contexts that we're exploring as part of the broader project that this is a part of. For instance, an Egyptologist adopts the vocabulary of the plantation, describing the various gangs of labor under his direction, later dismissing an overseer who had the gall to challenge the interpretation of a white man. An expedition to China results in the discovery of young talent, a docile, well-spoken young Chinese boy who would later keep things tidy and loyally perform needed tasks around the Penn Museum and eventually the Smithsonian. And finally, a future director of the Penn Museum starts his career at the ruins of Copan, where he takes a liking to young indigenous women, describing in vivid detail his sexual proclivities and desire for the vulnerable brown women at arm's length. This is our inheritance. It fills the pages of the archaeological archive. We need to take time to study, analyze, and eventually demolish this archaeology plantation. Equity, co-knowledge production, care, and restorative justice are not metaphors, but instead point to the, the work needed to disrupt the disparities that have existed in the field since its founding. Unless properly addressed, there will always be reasons for those most disenfranchised to keep praying for rain. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Riley. Uh, it's such a great reminder to us, I think, as we uh, think about this conference this weekend, um, about the place not only of objects in our collections, but also of, of the papers, of our archives, of the sort of rich mi written material um, that chronicles not only what we've found, but also, you know, the experiences of of ourselves and those who have come before us in these in these spaces. So thank you for putting that on the table for a discussion. So our next speaker, Dr. Keisha Supernant, has been a long-standing inter inter excuse me a long-standing textual interlocutor for me. Though we didn't have the chance to meet virtually really until quite recently, the onset of the pandemic and. Uh, in person today. <laughs> so um, Dr. Supernan is, is professor of anthropology at the University of Alberta, where she also serves as director of the Institute for uh, Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology. Her work with Métis and First Nations communities in Canada, and especially her recent work, uh, Recovering the Graves of Children Lost to the Residential School System, has transformed how I think about the potentials of community-centric and community-organized research. She's also been an incredible um, uh, interlocutor in her role as an associate editor for the archaeological section of the American, of American Anthropologist, where she and a great team of colleagues have been working to make the editorial process um, one of intellectual curiosity and generosity. And so I'm very indebted to her for that experience. That ethos shows in her recent edited volumes, which I encourage you all to check out. Archaeologies of the Heart, which is co-edited with Natasha Lyons, Jane Eva Baxter, and Sonia Adelai, and uh, Blurring Timescapes, Subverting Erasure, Remembering Ghosts at the Margins of uh, History. So thank you, Dr. Supernat, and welcome. Thanks. Fancy. Kisha Supernat Nitsi Katsan and Miskwichi Waskaigana Chimia, Otipimisiwaknia. 
It's good to see you all here today. I'm actually going to begin by recognizing the lands on which we are on right now. As an Indigenous person, it is very important for me to acknowledge the ancestral and traditional lands, the owners of these lands. And I think it's important as we reflect upon the hundred years of this museum, to think about the lands that this museum is on as well, and what it's done and whose stories it's told and in what ways. So we are gathered today on the ancestral, traditional and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabeg, including the Odawa, the Ojibwe, and the Bodawatomi, and Wyandot as well. So this is the ancestral peoples of these places. I want to thank uh, Tiffany for the kind invitation to be part of this panel. And I want to thank, uh, thank my fellow panelists. Uh, it's already been very rich and I know we're going to have lots to talk about. And I really appreciate being part of this conversation with you and with everyone here with us in the room and joining us online as well. I want to start by telling you about me. And it's important for your, me to tell you about who I am and where I come from for a few reasons. One of which I think was brought forward by Alison Wiley uh, last night, which is both our situated identity and the importance of that, but also our critical standpoint. And those are not necessarily the same thing. And over the course of my career, I think I have understood my situated knowledges, but also really defined my critical standpoint uh, in particular ways as related to who I am. So I am Métis, we are a recognized Indigenous people in Canada. We also have relatives in the US, although they're not formally recognized here. Uh, they're po we're a post-contact Indigenous people, which did arise originally out of relations between European fur traders and Indigenous women, but then formed our own communities, languages, histories, connections. Uh, and on my mom's side, I'm British, and it's been a bit of an odd time with the passing of Queen Elizabeth to be British and Indigenous at the same time. I have very deep family roots in the province of Alberta, as well as back to the Red River Settlement, which is in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And some of my uh, deeper roots actually come back east here in that uh, I have a number of Mohawk uh, ancestors who moved west and who I directly descend from. I got my master's degree uh, from the University of Toronto. And that's going to matter in part because I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey as a scholar, where I went from studying violence and warfare within archaeology to studying the violences of archaeology and settler colonialism. So that journey will tell you a little bit about my intellectual development, but also how we can think about a more holistic understanding of violence in archaeology. I also wanted to mention that I am a grandchild of Michigan. My PhD supervisor at the University of British Columbia was Michael Blake, who is an alum of the PhD program here. So I come from an intellectual tradition connected to this place as well. And of course, now I am situated in my homeland. Um, although I did not grow up there, I ended up there for very good reasons. And I direct an institute that really is bringing to the fore Indigenous archaeology, and not just by, with, and for, but centered in Indigenous communities in many cases. So where did I come from? I'm going to talk a little bit today about how I understood the archaeology of violence when I was a young graduate student. And I'm going to articulate how that transitioned into a very different engagement with violence, which occurred uh, in my PhD program. I was very much influenced uh, in my undergrad and graduate, early graduate work around the history of violence, and particularly organized violence, which at the time was a lot of the intellectual conversations that were happening in archaeology. Uh, books such as Warless Societies and the Origins of War, published by the University of Michigan Press, Raymond Kelly's work, Lawrence Keeley's work, War Before Civilization, and Stephen LeBlanc's work on the prehistoric warfare of the American Southwest. I was interested in warfare because I didn't understand it. And I think a lot of times we study things because we want to understand them and we don't necessarily understand them. I couldn't understand why people would go to war, why they would want to kill each other. So I engaged with these texts from that perspective of wanting to seek an answer and wanting to try to understand. And many of these texts were trying to find a way to understand why and how warfare emerged or to perhaps make an argument that warfare had always been part of the human experience and that violence was somehow inherent to being human, was to, to lead to violence. So in my master's then, I was exploring the archaeology of warfare on the Northwest Coast. I had done my undergraduate work at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, 
and had worked with some folks there before I went to the University of Toronto. And I explored the way that different scholars identified warfare in the ethnographic and archeological record, and then explored how that mapped on to what we knew about warfare and violence on the Northwest coast, focusing on things such as, uh, you know, the osteological analysis of skeletal remains for signs of violence, uh, burial and grave uh, goods. And particularly, I became interested in, in landscapes and defensibility. So the ways in which people position themselves on the land in order to defend themselves against violence. But even in this early time period, and this was, I wrote this 18 years ago now, um, I was dissatisfied with the search for an ultimate cause. And I think even at that, this time, I was more interested in the complexity, in the dynamic nature of violence and warfare. And I, that search for the ultimate cause, I think I found to be reductionist because it couldn't necessarily understand the diversity of why people might go to war or why, why violence might occur. And then also reflecting back on some of this discomfort from even this early uh, time in my career, I also think about how this is, uh, the texts I was reading continue to reflect the European philosophical debates, you know, the sort of Hobbesian Rousseauian ideas of primitive people. Right? and how that really influenced how warfare was conceptualized in the places that I was working. And so this is that you know, question uh, of whether or not humans are inclined to violence really draws from a lot of that debate. Was it an idyllic past where people were at peace or was it nasty, brutish and short? But I say even that question is flawed because it's of course neither, right? And both, or maybe somewhere in between. And I'm gonna to return to this idea later because I think it's something to reflect on in this moment is, you know, what are the stories that archeologists tell and how do we use the data that we engage with to tell them? In my PhD, again, supervised by uh, Michigan alum, Michael Blake, I was really interested in defensibility. Uh, I also fell in love with spatial archaeology and GIS, and I uh, was able to use the technology to analyze a set of petroforms in the lower Fraser River Canyon, which is in British Columbia. And this is a home of uh, Coast Salish-speaking peoples, and I was very interested in whether or not these petroforms, which they had previously been argued, were primarily defensive in nature primarily de designed to protect the inhabitants of this location, which my colleague Dave Sheppey had argued in 2001 and 2006. So I used the tools of GIS and of archeology span to measure and map and analyze these particular features and found out really that defense was possibly one use, but many of them had other uses as well, that their function was not necessarily or even primarily defensive in a physical sense, but they did have symbolic power of an enduring form of the landscape. Um, however, there's another part of the story. So this is what I concluded in my PhD work and had published and wrote about. But alongside this was something else that was going on. I was working in an environment where there were two different First Nations who were laying claim to the same exact territory. I was doing my archaeological work right in the heart of that conflict. What that meant is I had really wanted to work closely with indigenous interlocutors, knowledge holders, to try to narrate the past in particular ways alongside the science that I was doing. But when I tried to do that, it was a, uh, it exacerbated the conflict because each sort of side of this conflict wanted me to tell their story. And so I found myself going, well, how do I, how do I grapple with this? There was a question about this at the plenary last night. And I fell back on this idea of sort of neutrality or objectivity. It's like, well, I'll just tell the science then. But then I left out so much. And it had me really reflect on why this conflict was happening, how it was impacting my work, and what that meant for archaeology itself. Part of the issue was that one of the nations, the Yale First Nation, was in the uh, process of signing a modern treaty. The other uh, nation, which is part of an umbrella, Shohamo First Nation, was not. And they were deliberately not, because they felt it undermined their rights and title. The problem with the modern treaty process is that it makes you draw a hard line. This is the boundary of your territory. And the area that I was in was in both boundaries. 
but there's no room in the modern treaty process for a continuum of territorial engagement. And these are, <laughs> these are nations that are closely related, like there's cousins and other relatives, but they were, used, they were forced by the colonial system to draw a hard line. And so I ended up writing about this in a 2014 article with Gary Warwick, which is what is the role of archeology span in these settler colonial frameworks, right? Should it have been a case where I did archeology span at all? And that led me to ask the question in that article, how, you know, how can archeology span potentially cause harm? And are there situations where we should actually refrain from doing archeology span at all? And then Michael Blakey talked about this last night as well. Sometimes we just have to say, this is not the right thing to do right now because it could potentially make things worse. And my work did. They got caught up in that in a not productive way for anyone, including for me. So this really was a transition for me. And there was a number of things going on after my PhD, my job in my homeland, really working to reconnect with my uh, indigenous relatives and families, where my shift now is, my scholarship now is not this, the archeology span defensibility or of warfare, but it is about the violences of archeology span itself. So I've been reflecting a lot on this recently and especially with engaging with other scholars and interlocutors around this, about how archeology span itself has been and continues to be harmful. And I appreciated the discussion around direct and structural violence because I think that's a helpful framing. But I also want to encourage us to think of archeology span not just as structural violence, but sometimes as direct violence. And what I mean by this is that for many indigenous peoples, the land is a relation. And I mean that in a literal sense, not as a metaphor. And that caring for the land requires particular activities and engagements and to cut into that land and take ancestors and belongings out of it and institutionalize them is doing active harm right to to those relations there's of course the broader structural pieces to this as well we've heard about sort of the extractive nature of archaeology and some of the conversation last night was talking about shifts in, in that extractive model to something quite different and the relationship, of course, of archaeology with colonial um, systems, colonial structures, colonial histories, uh, and even colonial ideologies, right? So using archaeology as justification uh, for um, disconnecting Indigenous peoples from our pasts. And also, I think some of the papers so far have really illustrated some of that connection as well. And of course, how do we know in archaeology, right? So what is what are the questions we ask and then how do we answer them is very much still grounded in Western empirical systems of science that really center that as the right way to know, as the way to tell the truth or the only truths that are real, as opposed to making space for other ontologies and epistemologies, other ways of knowing the past. And then of course, the exclusion of many voices from the actual practice of archeology span itself and how that really can lead to particular kinds of narratives. So Amanda talking about how one of the ways to address structural violence in archeology span is to bring people who've experienced it and who are experiencing it into the discipline to expose it, to have those sideways glances. So how I've tended to frame my archeology span more recently, and I'll talk a little bit about the work on Mark Graves as part of this, is archeology span and restorative justice. And I've been doing work along these lines for some time, but I didn't, wasn't able to fully articulate it until I got to take part in the amazing Sapiens webinar and really was able to think about an archeology span of redress and restorative justice within that framework. And so I'm working on articulating what that really means for me. And at the core of it, I think it's not a question of what archeology span is. It is the empirical study of the material past. It is understanding the traces of the past and increasingly the present and what those can tell us. But I do want to ask, what is archeology span for? But perhaps even more importantly, who is archeology span for? I was trained that archeologists study the past for the good of all. My question is, what gives archeologists that right? Especially to study pasts that are not their own, right? What gives an archeologist the right to be the person who knows our history? 
And David Hurst Thomas talked about that on the panel. And I think this for me is the key question because it ties into those systems of colonialism, white supremacy, science as the only way to know, and asks us to think what gives us that right. And this really is what brings me to using archeology, span the tools that it brings to address issues that matter to people other than archeologists and specifically to people who have experienced the structural and direct violences of colonialism and related systems. So for me, an archeology span of restorative justice seeks redress. So using the empirical evidence of the past to bring forward those historical and ongoing wrongs to help expose you know, that, that history that Matt was going into the archive to, to talk about. To use the techniques of archeology span to serve community needs, to say what does benefit the community as defined by them. Uh, focuses on using archeological knowledge for justice and for reclamation, right? So and partly I think about my work with my own community as a way to help us assert our rights to where we come from, to demonstrate, in a, uh, bring evidence to where we were and what our lives were like, which will then allow us to reclaim our rights to those places. It's also really expansive because it's this idea that there are many, of course, ways to know the past and we've heard this over uh, the past you know, 20 or 30 years, multivocality, bringing in these other ways of knowing. Um, but I think it's really important that we recognize that it's not about finding elements from those other stories that support archeological uh, narratives, but it's in fact really making space for radically different ways of understanding the past. And then focusing on undoing histories of harm and extraction, repatriation, return, uh, you know, the assertion of and supporting of the assertion of rights to, to heritage by indigenous peoples, for example. So how do I do this? Many of you uh, may have seen the work, of course, that has been really in the spotlight over the past year, since Dekamut Tishwetmek announced that their a GPR survey had located potentially 200 unmarked graves uh, near the Kamloops Indian Residential School in Kamloops, BC. This exploded on the international scene and was reported in many ways incorrectly, which a point I'll come back to in a moment. But what is real about this, of course, is that residential schools and federal Indian boarding schools here in the US were deliberately designed to steal children from indigenous communities to quote unquote, civilize and Christianize them, to make them productive members of colonial society, which often meant laborers, Right, so we see the continuation of some of those uh, as well. What do we know? Approximately 150,000 indigenous children were forced to attend. It was illegal to not attend. Um, these places known as residential schools and thousands never returned home after. And those that did were really uh, part of broken families. And the trauma of that lives out in, in our everyday lives today. When children died at these institutions through neglect, malnutrition, violence, many parents and families never knew. They were never told that their child had died or where they were buried. So many of the graves are unaccounted for and the locations of these children's burial places are unknown. Even if they were at some point in a cemetery and marked, all the markers are gone. Sometimes even the cemeteries have been literally erased from the landscape. So what we're seeing now is a search for these graves across Canada. And it has sparked a conversation in the United States. While there's been this work happening in, in some places, I think we're gonna see a lot more of it here, which I'm grateful for. What of course is interesting about this is that archeologists are actually at the core of this work in Canada. The uh, results from Kamloops were done by an archeologist. And since that announcement, a number of other um, Results have been announced, many of which were long-term partnerships between indigenous communities and archeologists. Why archeologists? One, our work is that material evidence of the past, and that can include things such as remote sensing and geophysics, where we may not have that object, but we have the reflections that help us understand that object. And that we also have worked with communities. So many uh, archeologists in Canada right now are working with indigenous communities. And so that relationship then led to, you know, can you help us find our graves? 
That's how I got into this work. I never wanted to search for ancestors, and I specifically avoided working with any ancestral materials because I found it spiritually too difficult. But my relatives kept asking me, can you come help us find our graves? Because they knew they were out there, burial places of our ancestors. You know, we know they're out there, we don't know exactly where they are. And that's how I started doing the work. Started sort of building my capacity in remote sensing and geophysics. So what is the purpose of this? We're really trying to understand the scope and scale of the violence of these institutions and how those impact our communities today. And also, uh, it's not just residential schools. There was a whole set of what are called Indian hospitals where Indigenous people were experimented on and often by folks affiliated with universities, both anthropologists and medical folks, and people died there and we don't always know where they're buried. And ultimately, this is about justice and accountability because we had a whole Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was about survivors, and it was about witnessing the stories of abuse, uh, and then compensation packages were provided. But there was no real sense of justice, and certainly not justice for those children. And this is one of the slippery parts of that structural violence. Who do you hold accountable? Who faces that justice? It's a bit challenging, and the legal systems that we're forced to live in as Indigenous people don't really give us a way to, to hold the system accountable. So I think there's going to be some really interesting um, outcomes from this in terms of how do you address these structural violences that really led to, to genocide. I'm also trying to work uh, with our communities to build the capacity to do it ourselves and uphold data sovereignty around this to ensure that any information that is gathered through this process remains in the hands of Indigenous communities, which actually sometimes is difficult in Canada because the law actually prevents us from upholding Indigenous data sovereignty to the materiality of the past. There's one other thing I want to mention. Structural violence is also part of archaeology in other ways. We've seen an explosion of work over the past five, six years about how archaeology is unsafe. That people who occupy marginalized intersectional identities are often harmed by just being in archaeological spaces. In uh, 2019, uh, I, alongside a bunch of colleagues from the Canadian Archaeological Association, led by Lisa Hodgetts, did a survey of 562 Canadian archaeologists, which is a pretty good segment of our archaeological population. And we asked about experiences of discrimination, exploitation, harassment, and assault. And across all sectors and all respondents, 75% had experienced one or more of these throughout the course of their career, regardless of their identity. Of course, there were some elements of identity that were very important that we were um, able to pull out. And that is also, um, for example, women were much more likely to experience harassment and sexual harassment, and men were more likely to experience physical violence uh, within the discipline itself and that men were the vast majority of perpetrators across all the categories we asked about. So archeology span is also harmful for many who try to move through the discipline. And we've seen many high profile cases over the past few years that has really brought this to the fore. So it's also about how we treat each other in the present and not just how we understand the past if we want to make a more holistic analysis of violence and if we want to imagine a different kind of future for our discipline. And this is what really was part of our inspiration for heart-centered archaeology. This idea of reframing archaeology as primarily something of the brain and of the mind, this intellectual pursuit, to one that is about the whole person, that is about you know, how we treat each other, how we care for each other, how we understand our emotional responses and connections, right? Continuing to work against this myth of objectivity we all encounter the materiality of the past in particular kinds of ways. We all have our particular sets of situated knowledges that inform that engagement. And part of them is an emotional response. Certain objects, certain places evoke particular kinds of responses. But we don't talk about that much in archeology. span We don't give space, enough space for that. And then that, that core of the, the relations and, and recognizing the complex webs of relations in which we find ourselves. And this includes in the present, how we treat each other, but also recognizing that in the past. So that when an indigenous person says, digging a hole there hurts us, that we listen 
And we recognize that that is a real and lived reality. And then we also recognize that knowledge systems do all internally have rigor. I think we have a tendency to think about rigor as scientific. Every knowledge system that exists has an internal system of rigor, of what constitutes knowledge. It's not that people can just make up whatever they want about their lives and their histories. Each internal system has its own. And so there are many rigorous ways to know the past as well. So this has led me to ending with a question, which I think we saw in an earlier panel, which is what would a heart-centered archaeology of violence look like? Past, present, and future. Hi, hi, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Subernant. Okay, so I am um, <laughs> seeing folks moving. I'm very aware of the fact that um, two and a half hours is very long. However, uh, we started a bit late, so I'm going to say this. If for the remainder of our time together, you find yourself needing to pop out and hopefully pop back in <laughs> for a moment, we understand. Um, and, and please know that, that we are cognizant of that. Um, but that said, you might want to consider before you pop out because the next speaker is going to be amazing. So um, this is my great pleasure uh, this afternoon to introduce the final speaker on this panel, Dr. Rachel Watkins, who um, is one of those folks whose humility would probably make her cringe at the statement that I'm about to make. Um, but for me, she has been a almost mythical presence. Um, as a young black archeologist trying to decide whether or not to stay in archeology, span Dr. Watkins was among the handful alongside Dr. Blakey, who, who we got to hear from last night, of other black archeologists that I had actually been able to identify while I was an undergraduate um, before the formation of um, what has, has become this absolutely amazing Society of Black Archaeologists founded by Dr. Ayana Flewellen and Dr. Justin um, Donovan. But when I was an undergrad, that didn't exist yet. <laughs> and so for me, um, being able to uh, encounter her work in various spheres really set me on, a, on a, a different sort of trajectory, I think. So though our paths have almost always just missed each other, um, <laughs> we keep circumventing one another, um, she has been a beacon of hope, and I, I, I think that um, that is not true just only for me, but for, for many uh, other young scholars uh, coming up in this, in this space as well. An associate professor of anthropology at American University, Dr. Watkins is a scholar activist whose um, bioanthropological work on African diaspora communities in the United States and whose work with the Montague Cobb Anatomical a collection continues to uh, set new standards for bioanthropological research in the US especially, but I think globally as well. So to this end, I would really recommend a, a recent article of hers, a 2020 uh, historical archeology span article titled An Altered or Alternative Perspective on Historical Bioarchaeology. And um, you get the, the great privilege of, of hearing an outgrowth of, of all of that work. Uh, to close our session uh, papers out for today. So thank you, Dr. Watkins. Welcome. Okay, I think okay. I, yes, I have yes. it on. Thank you so much to Tiffany and the rest of the team for inviting me to be a part of this. The first thing that I want to say is that um, I'm from Ohio, go Bucks. <laughs> moving on, moving on, moving on. So um, I am really sorry that I missed the plenary session last night, um, not only because my esteemed mentor, um, my entree into biocultural anthropology, Michael Blakey, was a participant, um, but also because I knew that it would, um, so much of what I had to say have to say today would, um, you know, be echoing it. Um, but I am in the process of doing some work in Alabama and uh, also participated in a session yesterday for the Association for the Study 
of African American life and history, which is going on now. And so I am just um, coming from having had the experience of going to the Legacy Museum and the uh, International Memorial for Peace and Justice. So I'm I'm still uh, you know I'm I'm still processing um, that, and it has me thinking so much about this kind of holistic approach to studying violence or understanding violence within archaeology because this museum really brilliantly kind of lays out the connections between enslavement and mass incarceration and presents it as part of a, a continuum. Um, and so much of what comes out of the brilliance and a seeding leadership to our descendant communities has everything to do with our understanding of that continuum of, of violence. Um, and so I'm, I'm still very much so, um, you know, kind of thinking about that and that may kind of drop in and out of my um, talk today. You know, it also, of course, had me thinking about, because I was thinking about it here, um, archeology span and the role that anti-blackness plays um, in the violence that's perpetrated within archaeology, you know, the violence of anti-blackness, also the violence of denying anti-blackness. You know, I mean, this is why it's really important to think about violence as a spectrum, as well as the multiple dimensions of it. Um, I'm going to start out just kind of giving a really general overview of my, my work, which is based um, and my training is based in the William Montague Cobb Research Laboratory, which is a site of scholar activism countering racial understandings of human biological and cultural diversity for over 90 years. My research, teaching, and community engagement builds on this tradition by producing scholarship that theoretically frames and illustrates the limits of Western scientific realism through a black feminist lens. Specifically, I use the work of Sylvia Winter, Hortense Spillers, and others who build upon their work to identify epistemological underpinnings that sustain the racial ordering of humanity in scientific and social terms, demonstrate how the racial ordering of humanity also normalizes black people as the subjects rather than the producers of research, and to illustrate how these ideas are reinforced through research practices, and I include the social relations between researchers as part of the research practice. Narrative and other textual interventions, I use narrative and other textual interventions to ex expose the constraints that empirical data collection and analysis place on capturing biocultural realities. Methods intentionally vary, but share an emphasis on connecting spheres of knowledge, typically isolated from one another. And what I want to focus on today is um, Sylvia Winter proposes a science of the word that reflects us as homo narrans, our, you know, we're, we're storytellers, the storytelling nature of human beings. And that's been so much a part of the discussion uh, today. And she proposes this as a way of, you know, kind of exposing the, the, the limits of scientific realism by kind of engaging, interrogating existing narratives, and also exploring the, um, our capability to develop new narratives as part of addressing the violences of, of Western science and Western epistemes in general. And so in the interest of, of storytelling, one of the things that I always make sure to do is uh, I start out kind of talking about my intellectual lineage um, in the laboratory, um, starting with Cobb temporally because he was the first African-American to get uh, a doctorate in biological anthropology. But I also highlight how more broadly he is a part of a broader suite of scholars and activists who were engaged in taking on questions of black humanity, 
right? The people who were questioning the presence, the intellect of, of black folk. And that's something that was not just limited to science, nor did Cobb limit himself as a bioanthropologist to, to just scientific engagement. And so I think it's always really important to kind of think about uh, the African descendant presence within anthropology very broadly and certainly within certain subfields such as archaeology as being organically interdisciplinary and organically um, focused on theorizing Black folks into humanity and kind of providing these um, these interventions that allow for that. And it's important to note that that process is one that is not just about resistance, but it's also a place where you see the expression of internally driven um, creativity and uh, you know creativity and, and, and existence. In terms of the legacy that comes out of the Cobb Laboratory, um, I'm sure that Michael Blakey talked about the New York African Burial Ground uh, project last night. That is absolutely a part of the legacy of the Cobb Laboratory and some of the important pieces that came out of that. I think most notably for our discussion here, the ethical epistemology um, that developed from seeding control, um, seeding intellectual power to the descendant community um, and some brilliant and very holistic research questions coming out of that, that did a lot and went very far in addressing the existing epistemological violences um, that were at the heart of archeological research, certainly archeological research on black folks. Um, also uh, disrupting and kind of calling for accountability for this long tradition of just kind of the handling of black people's bodies remains in the past and in the present. You know, that, that scope, that vision came out of the descendant community uh, leadership, um, as well as an important piece around research and return, you know, research and reburial, even though there's not any legislation that exists to enforce that, they were able to, as a political body, in, uh, reinforce that and enforce that. Um, and at the heart of that though, and this kind of echoes what my colleagues have mentioned, you have to be willing to do that. So there was a team of researchers who came with commitments and an orientation that facilitated that. All right. So, Here's the other piece of my uh, intellectual autobiography that I need to get into. So at the same time that I'm at Howard doing um, in the laboratory, you know, participating in the uh, African Burial Ground Project, I'm taking classes some everywhere um, based on my broad interest in African descendant scholar activism, including classes at Howard University's Divinity School. And I'll tell you why I ended up there. I ended up there because in the early 90s, in the late 80s and early 90s, that is where the gender and sexuality studies, that's where the merging of anthropology and ethnography was taking place um, by way of these scholars who were doing uh, black liberation theology and womenist liberation theology. And so I was really interested in these intersections that were absolutely reflected in the work that was going on in the laboratory in terms of their broader impact and how I could apply them more broadly. And so that was a really important space where I was able to develop that part of myself. And then also, this is something that is typically not thought of as rigorous at all, but is a part of my, my heart-centered understanding of myself. I'm a sci-fi, I'm a sci-fi head. Okay, and it's really, really important to me. I was raised on Star Trek, um, you know, read all kinds of, you know, just was always reading. And the reinforced idea, the reinforcement of this idea of scientific futures and other possibilities for humanity in human interaction 
absolutely articulated with what I was learning about that in the laboratory. So the work that I do now has everything to do with every piece of me, not just the training in skeletal biology. The, um, a, a touch point for me in the laboratory was experiencing the coexistence of the Cobb Skeletal Collection and the ancestral remains from the New York African burial ground within the laboratory, and then having the ancestral remains from the New York African burial ground leave and be returned, be reinterred, while the ancestral remains that are part of the Cobb collection stayed. And as a really young person, that was really striking to me because I thought, well, there was all of this effort put into returning the ancestral remains that had a burial context, but these individuals whose bodies were used for uh, teaching of anatomy in medical schools weren't. And I, I wondered why that was the case. Right? And this kind of idea, you know, kind of led me to explore why it was that that was a kind of naturalized state, if you will, for these individuals' uh, remains. And that's kind of, you know, the, the foundation of, of the work that I'm continuing to do, kind of exploring the, the social history and the social aspects of these things. So this is all at Howard in a very kind of nurturing environment where um, you know, my intellect isn't being questioned, my presence isn't being questioned. I am surrounded by scholars and being mentored by people who are very much so grounded in this African descendant scholar activist tradition, which is interdisciplinary. So you know, this is what I know and this is what I know to be true. And then I leave Howard and I get very different messaging. I learn that there are material consequences of being associated with this African descendant scholar activist tradition. You know, there was a way that the intellect of black folks and the capability of black folks to carry out the work of the burial ground project was being questioned all the time. And I encountered that directly in my graduate, uh, my graduate studies. So, it was difficult at a very difficult time. And then Carol Crumley, who is a University of Michigan alum, walked up to me in the hallway one day in, uh, I think Alumni Hall is where um, the anthro department is at UNC Chapel Hill. And she said, you know what? She said, if you want, you don't have to struggle with this. I will be your advisor. And I'm sure we all remember in, in grad school, somebody, you're like, no, no, everything's fine. No, 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 no. Um, and so it took, me, it took me some time to you know, receive her offer, but I did. And the reason why it's really significant that this was Carol Crumley who did this is because, as you all know, Carol Crumley is somebody who has been looking at intersections and has been taking this interdisciplinary approach to archaeology for a very long time and looking at different ways of governance, right? Her contributions to um, heterarchy and all of these things had everything to do with why and how she got me and what I was doing and why she was willing to take me on. And if she hadn't, I'm not sure that I would have finished. So you know, one of the things that we need to talk about in the context of violence within archeology span and certainly epistemological violence is the individual responsibility that we all have as folks who are advising students and advising people who we want to become our colleagues. Right? That, that, is, that is serious business and we need to hold ourselves accountable to um, you know, for affirming people and the, the path that they're on because she had everything to do with that, along with, of course, uh, Michael Blakey, but I wanna, I wanna make sure to bring this part of my lineage together as well. So there's Carol, you know, and uh, Chester Chard was her advisor, but Eric Wolf was a mentor, you know, that um, Chard was, uh, advised by Julian Sewell. And then there is Michael, whose advisor was Janetta Cole, whose advisor 
was Melville Herskovitz. Then also, Michael was mentored and advised, right, by Cobb, mentored, who was advised, mentored by T. Wingate Todd, who was a physician who went to University of Manchester Medical School. And then, of course, we know Boaz, if you will, is at the, the root of this. So check this out. Does archaeology as it exists today allow for an intellectual lineage like this? Is this one that would be af affirmed or acknowledged if I didn't put it up there? These are, there are a lot of organically interdisciplinary bents and directions, and it's certainly multi-generational, multi-racial multi um, lineage that's here. Right. So when we think about African descendant scholarship, when we think about scholarship produced by black folks and other folks of color as being niche or as being too specific to be generally applicable to methodological and theoretical developments, I want you to have this in your mind. I want you to remember this, okay? Because this is just one um, representative example of how different ideas articulate organically, okay? And this is just representative because, of course, I could have the late Don Ortner in there. I'm going to find a way to include him. Tony Whitehead um, was also an advisor. Um, and so I want, I want us to think about this and kind of sit with this in the same way that Matt had us sitting um, with with certain texts. The last thing I want to share with you in terms of bringing all of this together is what Tiffany mentioned, my alternative native um, perspective. And this is something that comes from cultural anthropologist um, Gina Ulysse in a 2005 um, publication where she talks about as opposed to an alternative perspective, you know, again, going back to my family, my intellectual family tree, um, an altered native perspective, one that recognizes that there's a way in which our discipline and Western epistemes in general marginalize the work of people of color, but we're not internalizing that. We're recognizing um, our the, va the validity of our existence and the right of our existence. This is also a perspective that recognizes that clean breaks from the past cannot be made and that all researchers always are and have always been politically situated. And so again, when we're thinking about the violences within uh, archeology span in the context of epistemological violence, that's something to consider. The last thing I want to share is a model that kind of reflects where I am now with this work based on my lineage and based on much of what I've learned from various aspects of descendant community engagement that touches on, I don't know why this is going on, um, <laughs> that touches on um, some of the things that were already uh, discussed in terms of how to do our work with no harm or with less harm or moving us toward uh, reduced harm. And for me as somebody who is a skeletal biologist, what that means for me is considering decentering skeletal remains in my biocultural studies of black folks and looking at black lived experience. And why that's important to consider is because there are times, and so I hear it came up in the plenary last night, where research might not be um, necessary or even appropriate, to Keisha's point. Um, and so there's a way that we need to be drawing upon the interdisciplinarity that is a part, organically a part of our traditions to determine, to critically determine the necessity and the appropriateness of 
skeletal research. It may very well be the case that if we're holding ourselves to or holding ourselves accountable to have a certain level of literacy within various disciplines that pertain to the work that we do, that we might see that there's historical research that provides enough of a foundation for whatever it is, whatever questions that we're trying to get at, that don't require us to handle skeletal remains. These are also things that we are in a position of being able to impart to descendant communities. There are descendant communities that think based on the messaging that we have been, you know, that we're implicated in kind of spreading about the importance of our work and the ways and in, in, in the particular ways in which things need to be done um, that lead descendant communities to think that the only way to render their concerns visible is through a particular type of skeletal research or or genetic research. And we also need to make sure that we communicate that isn't the case. Um, and that kind of brings me full circle to our narratives and what sorts of stories we tell about ourselves and what we do as researchers. And so the question that I want to end with today is, you know, what role, um, what role do you want to play in, in the telling and untelling and retelling of our stories as archaeologists? Thank you. so we don't have to look at the, the beautiful window um, thing that we've got going here. All right, so thank you all. Can we, can we all um, just give another round of applause for this? this is, you know, for me, at least, this is a real treat. So um, thank you all for, for, for bringing such nuance and, and honesty and generosity to your, to your presentations um, today. So what I want to do is so we have a beautiful half an hour left together, and I would really uh, like to use this to its fullest potential for conversation if we can. Um, so there, are, there were, there are microphones, great, um, at either side. So if you have a question, is this a raise your hand situation? Yeah? You can raise your hand, the, the mics will be brought to you. And while you sort of gather your thoughts around what that might look like, um, I hope you will allow me to uh, put, a, put a first question out on the table. And that question for me, <laughs> you know, and maybe others of you watching this, is, is that, and a question that I actually myself get often with my work um, is, well, is violence even a useful analytic if it can be and mean so many different things? Why, why continue to engage violence as an analytic in this space? And I think, um, of course, we could do like we heard last night and have a quick, simple answer, which is yes, <laughs> and then uh, you know, call it quits. But I, I would love us to just sort of talk out, like, why, why make explicit conversations about violence, because I think we've seen, as I mentioned in other presentations, and we will continue to see that, that it is sort of always around us. But what is, the, what is the sort of impetus, what is the value to focusing on violence as, as a, an analytic uh, explicitly in this, in this space? Um, so I'll put that on the table, and I guess I'll also just invite, you know, if you had anything immediately that you wanted to respond to uh, amongst yourselves and the other presentations, I'll, I'll, I'll offer this space for that as well. I would say, wait, the quick question, the quick answer last night was yes? Yes. Okay. <laughs> My quick answer is I don't know. <laughs> 
Um, I don't, most of the time now, I'll be honest with you, I don't think so. And one of the reasons why has to do with, um, you know, there's this great quote from Christina Sharp, who um, I think it's, 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 uh, it's attributed to her, where she talks about the differences between spectacular violence and mundane violence and how there's a way that an attendance to spectacular violence um, is, is so very much so connected to kind of white liberal supremacist acts against the violence that really are more about the performance of white liberal supremacy than it is actually kind of you know putting an end to the violence against folks. Um, and so she warns against this kind of focus on spectacular violence because it you know, kind of obscures the mundane violences that have everything to do with the structural violence that we're talking about. And, you know, it's been my experience, for instance, with the move, uh, you know, situation, which I intentionally did not mention um, because it's something that is a, a clear example of that kind of spectacular violence and, um, and the attention around it is you know, very much so I think reflects a kind of white liberal supremacist project in that it has mobilized people in a way and the language, the discourse around it is as if it is new. You know, as if this is something that is new. And for many folk, you know, who for instance, remember when the MOVE community was bombed and who are, you know, people who um, have experienced or have family members who have experienced state sanctioned violence you know, that, that is not something that is, is new. So, you know, I don't know that we are equipped to um, engage violence in a way that is removed from that. So one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about, to your point, is trauma, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and thinking about how trauma should factor into this. And if I might follow up on that as well, I think this is a really important point because we've seen something very similar happening in Canada in response to the unmarked graves in that a whole bunch of people were shocked, primarily white liberal folks were shocked, uh, even though this has been known and even though the Truth and Reconciliation final report talked about you know, 4,000 children that they were able to locate that had never come home, like had died in the records. And yet people were shocked and horrified by, by this um, and there tended then to be a focus on, uh, you know, why weren't you listening to what survivors had been talking about for, for decades and, and had been sharing those experiences. And I do think trauma is an important part of the conversation, but also I'm inspired by your, your talk about science fiction, Rachel, right? Because it's also about futurisms. And for me, when we talk about violence and trauma, it can really lead to those damage-centered narratives as opposed to on questions of resilience and resurgence. And, and the fact that in the face of all of this structural and direct violence that we are still here and that we have always been here. And I think your points about the intellectual traditions that we emerge from, there've always, there've been black folks who've engaged in this. There's been indigenous folks, there's been queer folks, there's been women like who've engaged this for a long time. And uh, we're still persisting, resisting, and, and trying to move forward. So I do think there are times in which violence is a useful framework for communicating particular types of histories and to those sideways kind of glances. But I think we also have to be careful of not focusing on it too much because uh, there are other um, elements to the, the story that need to be told too. Um, thanks for those comments and it's, it's something I've struggled with um, in, in the kind of work I do, there's a, a the answer is yes and no, <laughs> I think. I think in certain contexts, um, describing or focusing overly much on violence can re-traumatize the very people that um, have experienced said traumas. Um, you know, post-traumatic stress syndrome is a real thing. Um, it takes place in many different forms and through generations. And I think we have to be attentive to that. Um, so I think this is where community work comes in, um, you know, in, in terms of whether or not looking at the violence is appropriate or not. Um, but I also think there's another side to this, and it relates to the sort of white liberal prerogatives of a lot of archaeologists, which is one of the, the most common pieces of advice I got pre-tenure from senior white academics was focus on the positive story. 
don't talk about that colonial violence part. Mm -hmm. And I've always seen them in real tandem with each other, right? That I have this story of resilience and I have this story of violence and they're interlinked so closely, right? And so I, you know, that tension, I think is a productive one to focus on um, in this case, but in some contexts, there's only, ears will only be open for very good reasons to one side or the other. Um, and so I try to pay attention at least to audience, but I don't think there's an easy answer and it's, it's very context and case specific. I'm really glad Rachel brought up um, Christina Sharp's work because it got me thinking, I mean, her use of the term wake, I think is also important. In the last decade or so, there's been a very pointed shift in vocabulary where previously, if we talked about slavery or colonialism, the term was always legacy, and I think there's a reason why we've shifted to afterlives and in the wake, and Ayanna brought that up with the coral, and I think that's, that shows the, the living afterlives of these forms of violence, and so the question of whether it's useful or not is that bind that, I'm, that Amanda brought up. I think it's so necessary because we're not just in a moment here in the US or globally in which there is an ignorance, but it's, it's a denial, an outright denial. And that's why archeology span can be crucial in providing that legitimacy to these forms of violence that are ongoing. And so I think you know, for, for Keisha's work in terms of the on the GPR, the, 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 what you see the features in some of this data, I think there, you know, there's a very pointed reason why I chose in my slides to have so much of the, the text from the archive there. This is not some speculative type of exercise that we're doing, but pulling the real visceral examples from the archival and the archeological record. But there is that danger of re-traumatizing. And it's something, you know, I didn't talk about my work in Liberia today, but part of what we're doing in that West African project is excavating sites of the Back to Africa movement. And we regularly confront the material signatures of the recent civil war. So how do University of Liberia students who were displaced and traumatized by that war, how do they engage with the bullet casings of AK-47s that were you know, very real to their early developmental years? And now we're pushing to think through the deeper histories of colonialism and settler colonial violence. So that tension between the necessary aspects of showing and not just telling of violence his historically and the real re the realities of uh, trauma in the past, I think is something that we still have to work through. I wanted to add one more quick thing and it's about denialism. And uh, so today in Canada, you'll see that I wore an orange shirt if you saw me yesterday, I was also wearing one. Uh, because this time of year is when we uh, honor survivors of residential schools by wearing orange shirts because there was a young indigenous woman who had her orange shirt that she was so proud to wear to school taken from her. And so we wear it because she couldn't. But leading up to uh, today, the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation in Canada, it's the second one, the, the first one was last year, the formal uh, federal holiday. There's been a significant increase in people trying to deny what happened and not deny that residential schools didn't happen, but that there's no, no graves, no bodies, demanding the bodies of indigenous children. And so I do think that archeology span uh, and evidence, the evidence can be used to counter those narratives that would deny that there was violence. And there I can see it is useful to frame it in that way because we have seen those narratives gain quite a bit of traction and uh, it's really important to have evidence to counter those, those claims as well. Thank you all for such a thoughtful session. Um, I'm wondering if your focus and emphasis and consideration of the archaeol or the violence of archaeology changes, affects the way you think about, approach, deal with evidence of violence in the archaeological record. Um, you know, we often talk about when we identify evidence of violent acts. We approach it in this coming back this idea of objectivity in this very kind of objective narrative way sometimes has had does is does dealing with the effect of violence in archaeology change your um, um, affect the way you think about evidence of 
violence in the archaeological record. I'm happy to start with a response because I think I, I talked about how I did study some of that evidence in, in the past. And I would say, you know, <laughs> the easy answer is yes. Um, <laughs> But I, I think what happens is that we, I think about our, uh, violence and the evidence of violence differently, in part because I think about the, all of what goes around that. So, um, for example, I think about trauma, and not trauma in terms of how your bones show when you've experienced violence, but the trauma of what that violence did to the person and to the people around them, potentially, as well. So I would approach, I think, violence in a way that wasn't so much focused on the act, but the outcome and the consequence, and something that was much more in the realm of that sort of social uh, and relational understanding of what violent acts did and, and what their consequences were. So I guess I'm prob probably more interested in consequences and causes, because I think we can um, understand those by looking at the consequences of the violences of archeology span that we have seen. And it, it invites us to think you know, about the, um, yeah, the kind of reverberations of violence and how it impacts societies more broadly. So my lens has certainly shifted. Uh, and I do think that there is certainly value in that evidence of, of violence in the past, but I'm not interested in sort of what it tells us about elites or inequalities. I'm interested in what it tells us about the the reverberating consequences of everyday life within those those societies. I will, I'll share that for me, um, one of the things that's come out of it for me is um, being mindful that William Montague Cobb was not just the architect of a skeletal collection that um, who did these amazing things and kind of resisted these ideas around um, racial typology and hierarchies, but that he was also a racialized subject. So I didn't speak to the details on the model that I put up there, but um, one of the studies that I'm doing now is uh, based on a sample of people from the collection that I'm actually structuring in relation to him so that he's not someone who is removed from looking at the black lived experience in DC in a particular time, because he was there, you know, kind of coexisting um, with some of these people who were there. So that's one thing that has come out of kind of compartmentalizing him. So kind of a way of humanizing him as part of humanizing, you know, kind of a, a more humanistic approach to looking at the people in the collection. Quickly add, I think it would kind of, it, it's pushing me to think more creatively about what the ma material markers of violence in the archeological record might be. It's, it's beyond the kind of traditional forms that we might see. And I think Amanda, your work is pushing us to think that grain and ethnobotanical evidence can be material manifestations of violence. And thinking about the work I'm doing in Liberia, imported ceramics can do the violence of neocolonialism in ways just as heavy as a gun or something more visceral than that. So I, I think it pushes me to think more creatively about violence in the material record, but also what's already been said yesterday and today about the context of how archeology span can and should be useful and for whom. So in the context of Barbados, for instance, we're working at a burial ground, it means that we are not going to excavate at all. And that's the, from the outset, it's just to say we look for different ways in which archeology span has been violent in the past. There's a long history of it on the island that has been very extractive and problematic, and it causes us to shift the way that we approach archeologies span of violence in the contemporary, I think. I wanna thank uh, everyone for a very powerful discussion. I, I have to admit, I, I feel more compelled right now by a comment than a question, if I may be allowed. Um, it relates to everyone's discussion, I think, but most specifically to Professor Riley's and Professor Watkins. So Montague Cobb has an article in the 1985 issue of the National Journal of the National Medical Association, which is the Black Medical Association. He edited that journal for nearly 40 years. And it's called The Black Non-Person and his examples range from the Ghanaian who 
introduced inoculation to colonial North America, completely overlooked in the history of inoculation, to a, a discussion at, of Broken Hill, uh, South African finds uh, fossil discoveries where the black laborer, laborer who made the discovery is completely overlooked and the Afrikaner supervisor is interviewed and so on. But it leads to a very recent event, talking about the present. And I, I deal with this in, uh, in American Journal of Biological Anthropology, something on it called Understanding Racism in Biological Anthropology, that uh, at the Smithsonian and the new human evolution exhibit in natural history, and a film associated with it, with Richard Leakey, Meeve Leakey, and Rick Potts as the principal discussants, the discovery of the Turkana boy, which uh, attributed to Kamoya Kemeyu, uh, a Kenyan national who grew up fossil hunting with Richard Leakey. Uh, in 1985, he received presidential awards. I went to the National Geographic, great presentation to him of the Le Gros Medal in 1985 with Richard Leakey. In this late, you know, uh, the film and the exhibition, he appears nowhere. And in the film, the Leakeys say they discovered the Turkana boy. And then late in the film, there's some comment about some staff member who brought them something. The, so I think the, what the, the message is that, um, that the only real complete human being in the room is the white person. They can be, uh, you know, you don't attribute an accomplishment to the cow or the horse. They are attributable. And then finally, also in this exhibition at the Smithsonian, in the David Koch Hall, Koch and Mobile Oil also funded the film. I think it's called Becoming Human or Human Becoming. They, it, uh, it's a sort of Aristotelian communication of the idea that since climate change had been natural and we are now undergoing climate change, Therefore, what we are undergoing, therefore, the climate change we are undergoing is natural. And uh, so that sets up for the whole human species uh, as the notion of the singular humanity of whites sets up for whites the, the right to take, you know, the right to theft. Um, so goes the, go the rights of the, the Koch brothers, these polluting billionaires. So we are in, in bed with an awful lot of dangerous things and have been for quite a long time. But thank you so much for, for mentioning Cobb and mentioning these erasures. Um, some of us are concerned right now about the erasures that are coming. So connected to the idea of care in archaeology, um, it, it seems like one of the flip sides of studying violence is the potential for healing. So for any of you that actually feel comfortable answering this, um, from your perspective over the course of your collaborations, how have you seen that element of healing like come across through this process of kind of like revealing um, the violence that's been invisible in many ways through archaeology? Thank you for that question, and, and thank you also to, to Michael for your reflections. Um, I, for me, it, it has to lead to healing. 
So, and the work that I'm doing, especially with the unmarked graves, you know, I, I can't, um, can't manage spending months searching for the graves of children of my relatives unless I believe it's going to do some good for my community. So I'm very much driven by, by the idea that telling the truth, and because this is really what the work that is, it's about telling the truth of the violences that, that are, are present, um, has to lead to a way to, to heal. And for me, there's, I do that in a few ways. One is the connection of that past violence to present trauma and present violence, right? And I think about the, the question of the connection between prisons and, and enslavement. I think about the connection between residential schools and prisons in Canada, where the vast majority of people in prisons are indigenous. I think it's between 70 and 80% of children in care are indigenous, right? So this is not just about the violences of the past. It's about exposing what that trauma has done to our families and our communities to be able to lead to a healing. So if we are re-traumatizing, doing it in a way that actually leads to an outcome that is healing. I can't determine what that healing is. That's not my job, my right place. I need to listen to the survivors, I need to listen to my community. But it needs to be on our terms, right? In, in, in ways that make sense to us, that involve our ceremonies. And part of that is bringing the children home, not in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense. So part of the motivation for finding the unmarked graves is so that we can do our ceremonies to bring those spirits back because they are haunting our communities right now. They're not home. They're not with their ancestors. And our ancestors are with us now, but these children are somewhere that they, they need to be brought into that space. So I think that, that healing is an, it has to be an outcome because otherwise I couldn't keep doing the work, right? I have to believe that that is, is what's possible. Um, but I also just wanted to respond to this question of the erasures of the present. One of my graduate students is doing work around the ways in which archeological and pseudo-archeological narratives get pulled up into white nationalism in the present and like QAnon movements and things like that. So she's using a historical example to uh, demonstrate how often indigenous archeology span um, uh, in North America certainly gets sort of subsumed into these, these white nationalist narratives. And I think this is something we need to continue to think very carefully about right now because I think it's going to happen more and more. And you even see that, of course, you know, with the ancient one and with the Salutrian sort of hypotheses and this, also this reinventing of a white past. I mean, genetically, we know whiteness is actually not very old, but we have this invention of this deep white past that has somehow been subsumed by all these people of other colors, right? So I think that there, uh, as we're doing this work of telling the violences, we also need to understand how the narratives we produce are being taken up by others um, who mean to do continued harm and violence. Well, I think I'll, I'll add to that, that um, in terms of, of healing, um, you know, engaging in work in a way that allows me to be both researcher and descendant is very important. You know, a lot of us are not just researchers engaging with the community, we're researchers and part of the community. And so being able to um, do work in a way that reconciles that and to also, you know, engage with the broader community in that way is, is also very healing. So, you know, that's one of the kind of foundations for the work that I do with um, you know, elementary, middle, and high school students. Um, and, you know, just kind of on the most fundamental level, you know, kind of exposing them to anthropologists who look like us. And, um, you know, when you're, when you're in a space with, with children, children tend to be very honest. And so they're gonna bring up for them what's going on in their community and what is making them upset. Um, and, you know, so it provides an opportunity to talk about how, you know, there are anthropologists who took on those same ideas and, you know, you can too, and maybe even to engage in some, um, you know, research methods in the classroom. So those are, that, those are a couple of, of pieces I think are worth noting. <laughs> 
Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so uh, this is kind of stemming off of uh, Keisha's comment about the deeper past. And, you know, it's really great to see that all of your projects and my own work in historical archaeology too, we're really focusing on restorative justice and engaging with topics of trauma. Um, but I'm wondering what you might say based on your collective experience um, to our colleagues here and elsewhere who work in more distant time periods about the applicability or even accessibility of thinking about trauma and practicing restorative justice on other time periods or parts of the world? Can everybody do it? Um, or is this just kind of so far the realm of people who work in the, the more recent past? That's a really good question. Um, I'll just, from personal experience, you know, I work in West Africa where those sort of lines between periods and quote unquote prehistoric and historic, those terms don't work. I don't really think they work anywhere to be quite honest, but um, you know, we aren't sort of bound by those in the same way that scholars working in other uh, world areas are. Um, but I've always considered myself someone who works in the deeper past, but who's been heavily influenced by the themes that historical archeologists have brought forward, which to me um, are my guiding goals, right? Structural violence, um, all of these kinds of things. So I do think it's possible, but I th for me, the easiest way to do that is to build these longer term genealogical connections into the deeper past um, that link with the present either in some temporal way or through memory or oral traditions or in some way, right? Um, because the ancient past is a really important additive to more that situates more recent histories. So in my case, in my work, the um, older pasts have shown high resilience and a high level of food security, right? And that shows really how odd the last couple of centuries have been in terms of human history, at least in this area, and how violent and destructive they've been. So I think we could give more care to um, not sticking in one period uh, of, of time as our focus, but in playing with those temporal comparisons through time. Uh, archaeologists are very good at doing this through space, and we're also really good at doing this through time. But that division of historic archaeologists and I don't know what to call them, uh, more ancient times archaeologists, um, it's not helping us at all. Um, and, and in fact, there's such a deep dehumanization that can happen in working in deeper time periods that it really concerns me. And I, you know, I came to Michigan to study the emergence of food production in West Africa. <laughs> Don't do that at all. <laughs> um, and part of it was this frustration with not being able to take these themes that were salient to issues, to my own experience, life experiences, um, but to issues of social justice back into the past. That's really difficult work, but you have to in some ways start from more recent periods to get there, at least in terms of how, what I've been able to do, but I'm sure others have a better response to that. Thank you. It's a really hard question to answer, and the reason I'm thinking about it myself, I've been involved in a uh, edited volume on comparative archeologies span of slavery. It's, a, it's been a really unique experience where the editors pair diasporic thinkers with ancient Roman archaeologists, and we're trying to kind of find a similar vocabulary to compare these particular topics. And I think what it pushed us to is to really think about something that Tricia said last night about really rethinking our research questions in the first place. Why do we want to compare the experience of enslaved Africans on Caribbean plantations with enslaved Romans? And if this is to produce quantifiable evidence of what the experience was like from better or to worse, we're asking the wrong questions. And I think that might push us to think a little bit more critically about broader human histories of exploitation and responses to them. And one particularly telling example as of late, I know many of us have gone through it or trying to go through it with uh, David Graeber and David Wangro's Dawn of Everything. And if we can think through different systems of domination and think about how that's materially visible in the ancient or more recent past, that's a far more productive way to think about oppressive systems and responses to them across space and time. 
And I'll just also add, I think there's a couple things I wanted to say. One is directly in response to, to Matt's. I think one of the things that we can do is move away from progressive linear understandings of human history, or even this sense of greater complexity that we're leading toward it. And so there is, I have many, many thoughts about Graeber and Wengro, but I will say that the premise of like, we have to get away from those progressive models is something I would definitely support. Uh, and because that's what we've been looking for, and so we've been finding them. And in fact, when you look more broadly and deeply, there are different kinds of systems of power, but they're not all leading up to the same kinds of outcomes, Van type, chiefdom state, and this sort of sense of progressiveness. So that's one area. I think the other area is in how we narrate the ancient past. And I think this is, I can really speak as a North American archeologist, right? My work has been here. And as an indigenous person of these lands, in that the ways in which the narratives have been constructed about our deeper history um, have also perpetuated some of the contemporary violences. Uh, from everything from the peopling of the Americas debates to repatriation and cultural affiliation. So why is it that the law says you have to have a direct cultural connection in order to repatriate ancestors? Every indigenous person in the Americas is more closely related to those ancestors than the people who hold them hostage. Every single one of us. So why is it that unless we can prove that was our direct ancestor, do we have to, do we not get to care for them, right? So I think that these are some of the areas where we can look into those deeper paths. And, and the earlier the, the ancestor, the more likely people are to say, well, we don't actually know who they belong to, so we can just continue to study them, unless DNA shows that they actually were connected. But that's, I think we need to move away from those logics. Those are our ancestors. And we, can, we need to be able to care for them in our own ways. So I think there's a number of things we can do in the deeper, more ancient past, um, you know, from the kind of models we use to understand to those very material things as well. Well, thank you. Um, I have now officially taken more of your time than I was allowed to. So thanks for sticking around. And um, thank you for this final question and allowing us to, to, to end on this note, um, I think, of, of exploration in, in a way, you know, like pushing our own bounds and returning to this uh, ethos of, of challenging the kinds of questions that we ask of ourselves, of, of the material record. I mean, thinking, as, as a few of you said earlier, thinking a lot more creatively about these markers of, of violence that we might choose to, to trace um, in, in our past and in our present. So thank all of you who are here in the room. Thank all of you who are live streaming today. And uh, we will be returning at 4.30 for our third session with Professor Raven Garvey. Thank you. <laughs>